Welcome to A Box from the Past, where we review older out-of-print games lost in the sands of time. Today is one of my favorites, the Star Wars collectible card game. Luckily, Matt has his old collection in storage, so we're going to put together some decks, we'll show you how the game works. Are these organized in any way? I don't know. I haven't opened these in 10 years. I'll go get the rest of them. So let's make some decks. What side should we each play? Light Dark side. side. Well, that always works out. All right, let's crack open these boxes. Star Wars customizable card game was made by Decipher in 1995 in the wake of the overnight success of Magic the Gathering. It released 11 expansion sets over six years until Decipher lost the Star Wars license in 2001. Each expansion focused on a third of one of the theatrical Star Wars films, starting with the original trilogy and continuing through The Phantom Menace. There were also cards based on some of the more popular Extended Universe characters, such as Mara Jade and Thrawn. The game is exclusively for two players, with one person playing as the light side and the other as the dark side. What the hell? Ooh, let's save that for next time. For a game, each player constructs a deck of exactly 60 cards. There are 8 basic card types. Locations represent space or ground areas that become the battlefield that everything else deploys to. Each location has between 0 and 3 force icons, and are put on the table so that the blue lightsaber icons are facing the light side player, and the red lightsabers are facing the dark side. These force icons represent the total amount of force each player can activate on their turn to deploy other card types or to draw into your hand. Character cards are people, droids, and aliens. Starships and vehicles help you get around the game world, and can also be used in battle. Weapons can be either character weapons like blasters and lightsabers, or ship weapons like proton torpedoes, or even pieces of standalone artillery. Effects deployed to your side of the table representing lasting effects on the game, and interrupts can be played at any time, and are discarded to gain immediate temporary benefit. So it's been a while since we played, but we're going to try to do a run-through of the game now. The game begins with each player choosing one location from their deck to start with, and deploying them both simultaneously. These starting locations will be added to and expanded as you draw other locations from your deck later in the game. Sites from the same planet are placed side by side, and the related planetary system is put at the end. You can travel between planets through docking bays, or if you have a starship with a hyperdrive. On each player's turn, you add up the total number of force icons on your side of the table, and deal that many cards face down from the top of your reserve deck. The white number on the lower left of characters, starships, and vehicles is the cost to deploy. So Luke Skywalker takes three force to deploy. Once spent, those face down cards get put into a third pile, the used pile. Any cards left in the used pile at the end of any turn get recycled back to the bottom of the reserve deck. Once all three of a player's piles are empty, that player loses. All right. Darth Vader, Mara Jade, and Boba Fett will start a fight with Chewbacca, Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight, and Jawa? Yeah. What the hell is he doing there? He lives here. It's Tatooine. What, you think just because your white bread colonialist Imperials come down and try to take over the planet that the natives are just going to abandon it to you? No, he's fighting for what he believes. It's his home. Okay, fine. Jeez. So. How does fighting work again? Alright, I'm supposed to pay one force to initiate the battle, and the first thing we do is fire any weapons we have. Okay. Luke will swing his lightsaber at Boba Fett. Draw two Destiny. Target hit if Destiny greater than defense. Whenever you're instructed to draw Destiny, Reveal the top card of your reserve deck, and use the number in the upper right of the card. Then place the card face down on your use pile. Typically, the most powerful cards in the game will have lower destiny values, as a way of balancing the power level of decks. 
The only exceptions to this rule are Emperor Palpatine and Jedi Luke Skywalker, who are broken as hell. What's his defense value? His armor is 5. Alright, I drew 7, so that's a hit. Luke casually lops off Boba Fett's stupid head, thereby sparing him the indignity of dying in a giant sand vagina. Like father, like son. Okay, so if we have ability greater than four, we each draw destiny and add that to our total power. And the loser loses force equal to the difference. I have 20. Hmm. And slave one in the Tatooine Docking Bay 94. Wait, don't ships have to be deployed to a system location? Yeah, so with each expansion set came a new sheet of rule supplements. For the most part, this was a good thing, as new rules allowed for more fun and engaging gameplay. But over time, they became a pretty big barrier to entry for new players, who would have to know a dozen expansions worth of additional rules before they sat down for their first game. Alright, here it is. Uh, so you can deploy a ship to a system only if it has a pilot. Otherwise, you have to deploy it in a docking bay. Wait, what is this? If you were confused on how to use this card, listen to the words of Er, 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 Er himself. Er, 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 This is in the official rules. One of Decipher's endearing quirks was incorporating a good amount of humor into their games. Cards like Brainiac with his destiny of Pi and power of algebra, or a card with all its text standing on its head, or references to other sci-fi franchises. Look, maybe we should just keep things moving, okay? It's just... Look. Okay. I'm gonna deploy Queen Amidala, ruler of the... What the hell is politics? No. No. I can't find it anywhere. I don't think I was even playing when they introduced politics. Okay. Let's just download the comprehensive rules. The complete rules for the game can be found online, and are now 161 pages long. Because of this depth, the game often plays more like a tabletop RPG than a CCG, because the rules allow for actions, scenarios, and deck building that very closely simulate scenes from the films. For instance, you can build a deck that recreates the Battle of Hoth from Empire Strikes Back by deploying the shield generator as your starting location, and sending out snowspeeders to fight your opponent's AT-AT walkers as they land beyond the shield and attempt to knock out your power supply. That kind of thing can be awesome, but what if your opponent's deck doesn't have AT-ATs? What if instead they just have a Death Star and they come blow Hoth up without bothering to land any troops at all? Now your snowspeeders are pretty useless, and the Battle of Hoth is over in a split second with a million voices crying out in terror. So if you want to play a more thematic game, you may want to agree with your opponent which planets you want to focus on, or what kinds of battles you're interested in recreating. On the other hand, it can be fun to mix and match characters and settings from various parts of the series just to see what would have happened if Obi-Wan had trained Leia instead, and they both took on Darth Vader and the Emperor, or if Figur and Dan and the modal nodes quit their gig at Mos Eisley Cantina to join the Rebellion. And that's the great thing about this game, the possibilities are really limitless. Fire four turbo laser batteries. Launch proton torpedoes. Unleash the TIE squadrons. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll fire my planet defender ion cannon at your lead ship, and Han Solo flies in on the Millennium Falcon to defend against your onslaught. Draw destiny. <sighs> well, the important thing is my job was revived. Actually, um, commence primary ignition and blow up the planet, too. The biggest flaw of Star Wars CCG is the huge density of rules and errata, making the learning curve very steep for new players. But the sheer fun of its recreation of every aspect of the Star Wars universe and every obscure character and event from the films, along with the solidness of the gameplay, make it a game we highly recommend. If you've played the newer Star Wars LCG, trust us, this one's a lot better. This is the real deal. Although the CCG was cut short due to licensing issues, and only covers four of the six movies, the existing cards offer enough diversity for years of replay value. I think it's well worth your time and money to pick this classic up. I agree. We hope you enjoyed our Box from the Past. 
Join us next week as we unearth a copy of Hungry Hungry Hippos from Matt's basement that has been roiling around in flesh-eating bacteria and infested with a colony of brown recluse spiders. Good night.